For more than 30 years, it was a plane that captured the imagination of the entire world. From Africa to South America, from Asia to Europe, from London to New York City, the aircraft simply known as Concorde galvanized the globe. Its sleek aerodynamic structure and supersonic speed brought passengers to a whole new level in transportation. In Britain and France, the plane became a symbol of national pride. During the Cold War, where every technological breakthrough seemed to come from either America or the Soviet Union, the Concorde proved that Europe still mattered. And while this supersonic transport became synonymous with patriotism, it's also remembered as a plane that turned into an economic disaster. With skyrocketing development costs and a hefty price tag for admission, when it finally debuted, only the rich and powerful were able to fly the Concorde. And in an era of heightened environmental awareness, the aircraft was denied the most lucrative routes across the Atlantic Ocean. If not for the endless sums of government money, it may have never seen the light of day. In the end, the plane was a two-edged sword. Hated by the economists, yet loved by the people, Concorde, after nearly three decades in service, became one of the most recognizable aircraft in the world. During a time when faster meant better, it soared over its competition symbolizing the absolute best in European engineering and aerodynamics. On October the 14th, 1947, aviation enters a new and uncertain era when Bell's rocket-powered X-1, launched from a B-29 Superfortress, becomes the first aircraft to break the sound barrier, flying at over 800 miles per hour at Mach 1.06. This breakthrough, along with the introduction of jet technology, causes countries to pour enormous resources into finding ways to go faster and faster. During the Cold War, with both America and the Soviet Union possessing the atomic bomb, the requirement that airplanes go supersonic is a must. This leads to a revolution in aeronautical design. Straight-winged aircraft, unable to achieve faster speeds, are replaced by swept-wing planes, most noticeably during the Korean conflict, as American F-86 Sabres battle Soviet Union MiG-15s. Bombers like the B-29 and the B-36 Peacemaker evolve into the swept-wing B-47 Stratojet and the B-52 Stratofortress. With the two superpowers investing gigantic sums of money into aircraft design, the nations of Britain and France are forced to play catch-up. In England, where the Gloucester Meteor symbolized London's place at the vanguard of aviation technology, during the Cold War, a trifecta of planes known as the V-bombers are unveiled as a deterrent force against the Soviet Union. The third in this trilogy, Avro's Vulcan, a supersonic bomber equipped with four turbojets, incorporates a new delta wing design, giving the aircraft increased speed over the swept wing. Across the English Channel, where aviation was born, the nation of France also experiments with supersonic aircraft. Dassault's Mirage III, a plane incorporating the delta wing design, flies at over Mach 2.2 .2 in 1958. In addition, the Durandel is also tested during this time as an experimental supersonic plane. But despite their respective legacies of being at the forefront of aviation technology, after the Second World War, with both England and France's economies shattered, it appears their best days are behind them. In the realm of military aircraft, there seems to be no way to compete with the vast resources of the United States. 
However, there is one area where if England and France pool together their resources, a formidable challenge can be issued against America and the Soviets. This comes in the form of a proposed supersonic transport airliner. Mr. de Gaulle was president of France at the time and pre French prestige was sort of important. Uh, the French were very, very concerned, as were the British and other Europeans, about the loss of technology prowess in the aviation industry. There was a feeling in Europe at that time that the Concorde project could be a vehicle, a catalyst to uh, jumpstart the European aviation industry after decline. With only military planes capable of breaking the sound barrier, there's much talk about having this technology cross over into the civilian transport market. With jets replacing propeller-driven aircraft as the preferred mode of flying, conventional wisdom leads many to speculate that the next logical step for passenger travel is the ability to fly faster than the speed of sound. In America, the undisputed champion of aircraft design, it appears inevitable that they will build an SST. The Soviets, not wanting to be outdone by their rivals, are no doubt going to follow suit. And this took place during the height of the Cold War. The Cold War was taking place. Uh, you have to remember there was competition in the aerospace defense. We had announced the Apollo program at the end of 1961, which was in effect a Cold War program. I, I think that the, the, the attraction of the supersonic airplane was like the attraction of much of the space age uh, prestige the national honor that you had to be, you were, if you didn't demonstrate that you could do this, you weren't in the, in the front ranks. This leaves the powers of Europe with an important decision to make. Will they build their own SST and compete on an international scale? The answer is given on November the 28th, 1962, when representatives from the English and French governments sign a treaty creating a powerful new consortium between the British Aircraft Corporation and Sud Aviation. Airliner of the future. This is a model of a supersonic jet which Britain and France hope will dominate transatlantic travel. Flying at twice the speed of sound, it will hop the ocean in three hours. Representatives of the two countries sign an agreement to share the $300 million cost and hope to have the plane operational by 1968. The Delta Wing craft will carry 100 passengers and cruise at 1,400 miles an hour. Engineers say it can use present runways and fly so high there will be no sonic shock when it breaks the sound barrier. The world grows smaller. The two companies agree to build a supersonic transport with no cancellation clause causing numerous airlines to immediately place orders, including America's Pan Am Airways. Pan American World announced it has ordered six new Concorde supersonic jet transport, which can fly to the United States in two and a half hours. You can tell him he's given me the best argument for not having one airline represent the United States that I've ever heard. And I'm going to spend the next time I'm here really giving a screwing to Pan American, because that, gives, that sticks it right to us. How can we possibly go ahead now with our program, to which we're going to spend an awful lot of money, which was very important to the United States, which affected the balance of payments in hundreds of millions of dollars, and I'm going to put all this out, and then go ahead about 24 hours before we're about to make our announcement. Across the Atlantic Ocean, this treaty causes President Kennedy to act swiftly. And in June of 1963, at the Air Force Academy's graduation, he announces the United States' own SST program. 30,000 spectators packed the stadium at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs for ceremonies that will graduate cadets into officer ranks. They hear President Kennedy call for a partnership of government and business to develop a supersonic passenger plane to hold the U.S. lead in commercial aviation. They had been under some pressure uh, to announce this project. Pre uh, Vice President Johnson formed a little committee to look at the SST in the spring of that year, and he recommended vigorously that we go ahead with an SST. The Anglo-French had announced the Concorde project in 62, and that also created pressure for Kennedy to do something. There was also some pressure from the aerospace industry people uh, to respond to what was taking place both in uh, Britain and France and also Russia, which had its own SST program. In the Soviet Union, work begins on their supersonic Tupolev Tu-144, 
with each plane now in a race to the finish line. Beginning in 1965, two prototypes are built, known as 001 in Toulouse and 002 in Bristol. Luckily for Britain, its aerospace industry has a huge jump on the competition, having built numerous experimental aircraft proving vital in the research and development of the Concorde. The Bristol 221, incorporating a variation of the Delta design known as the OG wing, is tested in order to determine the SST's range and payload. The TSR-2 bomber, an airplane cancelled due to the budget cuts of the 1950s, provides invaluable information about the Concorde's most daunting obstacle, its power plants. Using Bristol's Olympus engines, the TSR-2's testing sheds new light on the challenges supersonic planes face in the air. In the laboratories of the British Aircraft Corporation and Sud Aviation, rigorous examinations are carried out, investigating hundreds of materials and the effect heating has on them. Building the Concorde uh, required new materials and they had concerns about heating, which had never been a, uh, a sustained problem. Had people that had encountered heating in, in certain instances in, in uh, brief encounters with supersonic flight, but if you're going to cruise at supersonic flight, then you've got a totally different heat dissipation problem. For a period of 18 months straight, round-the-clock, 24-hour trials are conducting. At its peak, over 600 subcontractors are brought in to work on the Concorde, employing over 200,000 people. Filton, Concorde 002 stands like a great bird in a massive cage at the British Aircraft Corporation's plant near Bristol. But never has there been such an expensive bird before, nor one that has been so reluctant to fly. When she's ready to fly, she'll fly. Nothing must be left to chance. Concorde is unlike any other aircraft. Everything about her is new. In the wind tunnels, the OG wing passes with flying colours. Full-scale mock-ups are constructed in order to show all of this SST's components. The drooping nose, a distinct feature of the Concorde, is built in order to balance pilots' visibility with its incredible aerodynamic structure. And using a converted Vulcan bomber, the Olympus 593 power plant is tested in the skies. For Concorde's team of designers, its engines proved to be the most important obstacle to overcome. Uh, the airframe was in advance of the engines and advance of the fuels at the time. Had, had you had 10-year advanced engines to put in it, and uh, you, you, you might have possibly made it a more sustainable airplane. But as it was, it was a prestige airplane. For the 593's jets to work properly, air needs to enter at subsonic speeds. A huge roadblock, considering the Concorde is built to fly at twice the speed of sound. Fortunately, over a period of four years, a complex system of inlet doors and ducts are installed in order for this SST to travel at Mach 2. By April of 1966, the final assembly of 001 and 002 begins. With each country producing different parts of the Concorde, they're shipped across the channel in order to make sure both prototypes are ready at the same time. Massive transport aircraft are used to ship some of the biggest pieces of this giant jigsaw puzzle. For the people of Toulouse and Bristol, Seeing specially designed trailers hauling different parts of the plane are not uncommon during this time. And by December of 1967, Concorde 001 makes its first appearance in Toulouse. Its mesmerizing design stuns the entire world as aviation enters a new high-speed age. Toulouse. The giant hangar at Sud Aviation's headquarters was the focal point of the entire world. For inside was the most exciting new thing in the world of aviation, Concorde 001. At last, the Anglo-French brainchild, born out of the technical and very sensible collaboration of two nations, could be shown to an envious world. 
while Concorde is being set up for its first test flight, in Moscow, the communists are able to beat the Europeans, debuting Tupolev 144 on New Year's Eve 1968. Being almost identical to the Anglo-French design, it's nicknamed Konkordsky around the world. Unfortunately for the Soviets, it's nowhere near the Concorde in terms of structure and quality, being put together so hastily. And the Russians ran into even worse problems with their version of it because their engines were comparatively far less efficient than, than the uh, uh, Rolls-Royce and the French engines. In America, delays and uncertainties about their SST program continue. A competition between Boeing's swing-wing and Lockheed's fixed-wing design causes the selection committee to debate endlessly the advantages and disadvantages between the two. It turned out that this, the, the swing wing didn't work, so they went with the fixed wing. Then it turned out that this plane was going to be too heavy anyway, so they tried to lighten it. But it could never really, it, the only way it could pay for itself is it couldn't really carry that many people, but secondly, because it was so heavy, it would have to charge a lot, a premium on the ticket, and that, meant, that made the, the economics go haywire. When the decision is finally made in the winter of 1966 to award the contract to Boeing, the Concorde already has a two-year jump on its transatlantic competition. For the Europeans, a far more important threat to the aircraft's survival comes in the form of a jumbo jet. Boeing's 747, a subsonic airliner capable of flying passengers across the ocean far more cheaply than the Concorde, has those in Britain and France worried. And in a sense, the Boeing company and airline companies as well understood that this was the real vehicle for leadership in commercial aviation. The jumbo jet, the 747, efficient subsonic jets of a variety of kinds, these were the vehicles that were going to keep America, uh, keep leadership in America in commercial aviation, not the American SST project. This fear is amplified when the British Overseas Aircraft Corporation decides to purchase the 747. Perhaps Faster does not necessarily mean better. Despite these outside threats, as well as concerns about its growing costs, Concorde 001 is cleared for its first test flight in March of 1969. Toulouse, the great supersonic jet liner was going to fly. A year late, millions of pounds over the estimated cost, and still a very big question mark, but on this day, a lot of those question marks would be answered. For Concorde 001, this was the chance to prove she was the super bird everyone had hoped and worked for. Its maiden voyage is flawless, encountering no technical problems. For testing purposes, its undercarriage is kept down. In France, they can breathe a sigh of relief. One month later, across the channel, 002 takes off, making another perfect flight. You had to have really the true professionals here. There's, there's no point in the flight in which a, a, any kind of a crew error uh, couldn't have caused a disaster. So it, it was a um, great leap forward. We, we didn't have the advanced electronics that we had in, uh, later. And uh, so for its day, it was really an advanced machine. Uh, Concorde 002 is clear takeoff. And good luck, gentlemen. For the next two years, a series of grueling tests are done, studying the impact that intense heat has on the nose and body of the aircraft. In the sky, Concorde proves easy to maneuver, as the two prototypes exceed both the speed of sound and Mach 2 during this time. Every detail is checked and double-checked, with nothing being left to chance. In America, with growing protests over the environmental impact of these planes, including the effects of the sonic boom, in 1971, the United States Senate votes to cut off all funding for Boeing's SST. Good evening. The Senate has voted 51 to 46 to cut off money for building the supersonic transport as the House had done before. 
Unless private financing is forthcoming, the controversial airplane appears doomed. With this catastrophic decision, Concorde's most fierce competition is eliminated, clearing the way for it to dominate the global marketplace. In Britain, the plane becomes a symbol of pride. It was a proud sight. This was the day when the traditional and the modern were brought together. The British Concorde, that masterpiece of technology, came to London to be seen by the Queen, her family and the millions who looked up with excitement for a first glimpse of this great plane. Then, in 1973, at the Paris Air Show, a Soviet Tupolev 144 crashes for the entire world to see. This disaster raises great doubts about the communist concoction's feasibility. It appears Concorde has all but won the race to build the first fully functioning SST. Now, will anybody want to buy the plane? After nearly a decade in development, the Anglo-French Concorde flies to the African nation of Senegal to begin its worldwide promotional tour. The ultimate goal of this exercise is to convince the world's airlines that speed means business. And with the right dose of public relations, executives will be convinced to buy these planes. From a marketing standpoint, the tour is an outstanding success. For years, people across the globe hear stories about this new high-speed plane that takes passengers to their destination in half the time. Its unorthodox aerodynamic design brings in crowds from Rio de Janeiro to Beijing, from Tehran to Sydney, from Fairbanks, Alaska to Mexico City. And with America cancelling their SST program in 1971 and the Soviet Tu-144 in shambles, the Anglo-French Concorde is destined to dominate the marketplace. Unfortunately, with the 1970s being defined by an oil crisis and economic unrest, the enthusiasm for a supersonic transport is a far cry from the previous decade, when anything seemed possible. The question now is, can this aircraft defy the odds by flying passengers around the globe in record time while remaining economically viable? This becomes the Concorde's greatest challenge. Across the globe, Concorde is ready to galvanize the people. Wherever it flies, the crowds are huge, anxious to see the plane they've heard about for years. During the year 1972, this SST tours Iran, India, China, Japan and Australia, with each country's airlines showing interest in the aircraft. Kings and queens, prime ministers and presidents, rich and poor, all want to take a tour inside this remarkable supersonic jet. Unfortunately, during the 1970s, with each Concorde costing a record $31 million per plane, only the very wealthy are able to board this aircraft. Ironically, its biggest supporters are the masses, who could never afford to fly supersonic. As a result, although there's a fascination with the Concorde, the big airlines are hesitant to pull out their checkbooks. The Chinese and the Iranians flirt with the idea of buying them, but are unwilling to sign on the dotted line. In the United States, where the most lucrative destinations are to be had, President Richard Nixon tours the aircraft. His country's decision to cancel their own SST is the result of a growing environmental movement, warning Americans about the ecological disasters these planes will have on their neighborhoods and communities. A big drawback is the sonic boom. When a plane exceeds the speed of sound, a large noise capable of breaking windows and glass erupts. When scientists study the effects of this boom in Oklahoma City during the year 1964, 
they conclude this noise will cause a public revolt. It turns out that the sonic boom, in fact, bothered lots of people. And this was clear very early on when they started to do research on the sonic boom in Oklahoma City. And a report came out in 1964 which, show, which showed that a huge majority of the people, quote, could not live with a sonic boom, unquote. And the people who live with it are becoming more aroused, becoming more sensitive to this form of pollution as they are to so many others. The nation's priorities are changing rapidly, and the FAA may find that the general public has a different timetable in mind for the reduction of noise pollution. David Culhane, CBS News, New York. It's such a hot-button issue that the United States government places a ban on all SSTs traveling coast to coast. With this decision, Concord is limited to only the east and west coasts in America as destinations. As a result of this policy, no American airline wants to touch the plane. Once they kill the New York to LA route, the Miami to Seattle routes, the Boston to San Francisco routes, the Washington to LA, LA routes, once it killed the, those routes, it killed about a third of the market for the whole aircraft. And therefore, therefore you, you didn't have as much uh, chance to recover your cost. People in the United States reacted to the sound barrier as a, uh, a means of uh, uh, going against the idea of an American supersonic transport, and it, of course, affected the issue of the Concorde flying in the United States. But I don't think it was a, a, a defining decision. And I also think it was a bit of a red herring. I think it was put up mainly because people who were smart enough to see there was no way to make any money out of the Concorde, building it, the, the manufacturer was going to lose, the government was going to lose. I think it was perhaps uh, overinflated just so that we wouldn't do it and we wouldn't have an American contender. As environmental groups gained strength, pickets and protests against the SST's sonic boom, against its unhealthy fuel consumption and against noise pollution in general take place. Rumors begin that any passenger who boards the plane will become violently ill. This bad publicity sours the Concorde's reputation. Thankfully, the two countries who built the aircraft come to its rescue. When British Airways and Air France order nine planes for service, they save the entire project from economic collapse. Unfortunately, the overseas buyers needed to make this a worthwhile government investment never materialize. What began as a European project is confined only to Europe. Despite these roadblocks, Concorde continues its worldwide tour de force. To prove it can fly in the most brutal weather conditions, the aircraft stops in America's Arctic outpost, Alaska demonstrating that this SST can excel even in the bitter cold. Next is a flight to the polar opposite, Mexico City, where thousands of people wait for hours to see Concorde's grand entrance. With orders placed, the employees of BAC and Aerospatial begin building more SSTs, improving the quality from the original prototypes. The Bristol 593 engines gain strength, reducing the black smoke emitted. And in 1975, Concorde receives its Certificate of Airworthiness. When agents are first allowed to book passengers, demand skyrockets. A beautiful airplane that performed well. I was lucky enough to fly on it on one occasion, and uh, there's, it, was, it was the way to travel. There's no question about it. You arrived in London in, in what seemed like a you know, a couple of hours and uh, feeling excellent. Although 20% more expensive than subsonic travel, during the early years, with all the hype and fascination surrounding this plane, the people cannot resist the opportunity to fly supersonic. One year later, the first two Concords carrying paying customers depart from London and Paris simultaneously. Almost a decade after its first test flight in 1969, the dreams of this SST are finally realized. Concorde is given a boost when its only competitor, the Soviet Tu-144, fails miserably. 
its crude design and enormous fuel consumption fades quickly. Only a few months of novelty flights take place, clearing the way for the Anglo-French. Despite this early success, the road ahead for this powerful new plane is going to be a bumpy one. In America, the Boeing 747 jumbo jet proves to be Concorde's greatest competitor, carrying more than twice the passengers at a fraction of the cost. In the Big Apple, where the most profitable route of London to New York is crucial, because of noise pollution, a judge rules that the supersonic airliner cannot land in the city. Over in Britain and France, many speculate that because the United States could not get its SST up in the air, sour grapes causes America to punish Concorde as a result. Only after a Supreme Court ruling is the aircraft allowed to land at JFK International Airport in 1977. Almost 20 years later, it would set the world record for transatlantic flight, travelling from London to New York in less than three hours. By this time, however, with rapid inflation, an oil crisis and growing environmental concerns, people begin speculating that this plane's time in the sun has passed. People would pay the additional cost to fly faster than the speed of sound. Whatever, however you valued your time, one times the value of your time, 1.5 times the value of your time, that's what people thought. It turned out, in fact, that this was a very questionable assumption. The whole idea that there would be a market for people paying a premium to go faster than the speed of sound on commercial aviation, in fact, was a facade. It turned out to be a facade. It was not true. It was a mirage. During dire economic times, Concorde is viewed as a plane only for the super rich. The clientele was superb. I mean, they, they were really, really rich people. Flew it. I can recall on the one flight that I made, there was a group of about five or six kids, all in one family, and who were making their 15th or 16th Concorde flight and were totally blasé about it. So it taught me that, uh, you know, the Concorde was for rich guys. The novelty effect has worn off. The enthusiasm of the 1960s, when it was first built, is replaced by the cynicism of the 1970s. Each year it's in service, Concorde fails financially, unable to turn a profit. As the 1980s begin, many feel this technological marvel's days are numbered. However, it's miraculously saved when British Airways decides to buy its planes from the government outright. With this decision, a new marketing campaign is launched to bring Concorde back to life. Discovering that its rich clientele are willing to pay more to fly supersonic, prices go up exponentially, making it a vehicle exclusively for the super wealthy. As a result, it's marketed as such, and for the next two decades, the plane stays afloat. Then, after more than 30 years, Concorde Flight 4590 crashes, raising doubts on the safety of supersonic flight. With the terrorist attacks of September the 11th, 2001, and the decline in air travel that follows, both British Airways and Air France decide to cancel service of the Concorde. In the end, the aircraft became a mixed blessing. I think that the Anglo-French Concorde project may have been a model that showed the Europeans that they could collaborate in aviation. And while the Concorde itself was not successful, it may have been an impetus toward forming Airbus, which has been relatively successful in building aircraft and becoming a formidable competitor uh, to Boeing. So in some ways, although the Concorde itself was not successful, maybe it was a catalyst or vehicle to create a, a successful larger enterprise called Airbus. Without question, its ability to travel at twice the speed of sound made the plane a first-class attraction wherever it landed. Over a period of several years, Europe's finest produced a true technological marvel, epitomizing the very best in engineering and aerodynamics. 
for those reasons, Concorde goes down in the history books as one of the greatest aircraft ever. In Britain and France, it was more than just a plane. It came to symbolize a time when they, and not the Americans, were at the top of the mountain. Just as England had ruled the seas with their dreadnoughts, they would rule over the skies with their Concorde. But with all its state-of-the-art capabilities, it became out of reach for the average man, woman and child, who, ironically, became the Concorde's biggest supporters. With the dim realities of the 1970s, the plane's biggest obstacles were not in its jet engines, nor in its payload, but with a sceptical public, who grew cynical at the idea of government and big business teaming up to produce a plane that only the privileged and powerful could fly on. It was a, a beautiful airplane, still is a beautiful airplane, and it, it's just a shame that perhaps it's a sumptuary. Maybe you don't need to go supersonically, and uh, obviously not, not enough people need to go supersonically to justify the market. Now, with the ability to communicate in a matter of microseconds through the use of computers, the Concorde symbolizes a much different time, when the best technology available to see each other in person was the airplane. In this era, faster meant better. And in getting people to their destination, no aircraft has been able to surpass the speed of the Concorde. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.